to my virtual talk. I would uh, like to start by thanking the organizers for giving us the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the work that has been uh, produced out of a collaboration between Clark University and the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And in this particular uh, case, we focused on, on trying to find candidates that would allow us to transition from perfluorinated polymers to, um, to organic-based, non-fluorinated or, or low-fluorinated containing um, materials as membrane separators for alkaline redox flow batteries. So I want to start by telling you a little bit about the motivation for this work, and, and that is the pressing need for a transition to renewable energy. Uh, more specifically, uh, we all know that, that um, in the last few decades there has been drastic climate change that is affecting all the ecosystems in the planet. And we also uh, know that a lot of this climate change is linked to human activity, and more specifically to, uh, to CO2 emissions. Now, the, the, the good news here is that there is, there is potentially a solution to this problem. It just requires that we shift our, our methods of energy production. More specifically, we have to switch towards uh, renewable energy alternatives. And some of the most potentially implementable at large scale at this point are wind and solar energy. They are clean, they're now the technology has advanced to a point where they can be produced uh, cost-effectively. So the, the challenge is not energy production anymore. The challenge becomes their intermittency. And what I mean by that is the sun rises and sets every day, which means at night you can't really generate the electricity you may need when it's dark. The, the, the wind patterns are geographically and weather dependent. And um, in many cases, there you may live in, a, in an area of the country or, or the planet where, where high wind areas are not... Um, accessible. So one way to mitigate some of these issues is to be able to store all that energy in a cheap and scalable way so that you can transport it from where it was generated to where it needs to be used. This also allows you to, to solve another issue, which is the mismatch between when the energy is needed, and that is the grid demand. You can see it fluctuate uh, as a function of time here, and, um, and the energy production in this case, in the case of the wind and the sun, the intermittency can be weather and, and, and time dependent. So in general, what tends to happen, for example, focus on the solar energy cases, the peak of production is not happening at the same time as the peak for demand. They tend to be mismatched. And if you could just store all that high energy production for a few hours until you're actually going to need it when it's darker, then, then things would be significantly more efficient. And then one potential candidate to achieve this energy storage are redox flow batteries. And I'm going to show you in this case two, two cases or two candidates that are, are very similar and they, they tend to share some of the advantages. They can decouple capacity from power very, very easily. That means how much energy you produce versus how fast you make it. That allows you uh, a large flexibility in design. You can make them big, small, uh, and, and all kinds of different locations. They're highly efficient systems and they can respond quickly to changes in the, the energy production demands. Now, in the case of vanadium, uh, a couple of these advantages with this system is that the, the ingredients are relatively high cost. It requires a, re uh, a high concentration of acid uh, to run, which also means the containers need to be uh, uh, resistant to these corrosive environments. And in many of the cases, the membranes that are used to separate the electrodes uh, cannot stop the vanadium ion species from crossing from one electrode to the other one, which tends to reduce the capacity of these batteries. Now, in the case of the organic redox flow batteries, they share most of the, uh, the advantages. They, uh, they are, the ingredients tend to be lower cost than those you could, you would need to buy from a vanadium uh, system, and uh, they can be assembled using electrolytes that are less corrosive. Now, some of the disadvantages of the, um, the organic redox flow batteries uh, are that the, these electrolytes tend to be lower, can be lower electric, uh, electric conductivity, and that ultimately affects the efficiency of the system. And some of the molecules that have been tested as potential redox active molecules in this case um, are either less stable or less soluble. So we, when we got involved into this work, um, we we started from a system that was developed at Harvard that solved many of these issues. Uh, in this case, they are using a negative electrolyte that's based on a dihydroxylated anthraquinone. 
and the positive electrolyte is a coordination compound, um, ferricyanide, that undergoes a one electron transfer process. So in addition to the tanks, you need a, an ion selective membrane separating the two, the two electrodes that, that must allow permeation of potassium through, through the membrane, but prevent the uh, crossover of both ferricyanide and the, uh, the anthraquinone material. In addition to this, it also needs to be relatively low cost and chemically and electrochemically stable. So Nafion uh, to 12 uh, uh, fulfills most of, most of these requirements. It is relatively conductive, it's very stable, but it is also relatively high cost. So our efforts were focused on trying to find a candidate that would allow us to replace Nafion. And uh, we decided to start by thinking about polyaromatic systems such as polyether ether ketone, where you can sulfonate some of the aromatic rings and then tune the ionic conductivity based on the number of sulfonic acid groups present in the backbone. So if you, if you think about those two structures and you compare the properties, <coughs> the, um, the sulfonated polyether ether ketone with, with this level of sulfonation has high ex exchange capacity, higher water uptake, but notably the permeability coefficient of ferricyanide in these conditions is about two orders of magnitude lower than what we can measure for nafion. So it should lead to better capacity retention and overall better battery efficiency um, uh, if, we, if we were to switch that system. Uh, better yet, uh, a quick calculation allows you to predict that in that case, because the crossover is so much smaller, you could potentially retain your, your overall charge or capacity for a much longer period of time compared to what you could retain with, with a nafion membrane that allows some level of uh, uh, redox active uh, molecule crossover. Now, for two membranes of comparable thickness, another advantage is that SPEAK exhibits lower area-specific resistance, and uh, because the resistance is lower, overall the efficiency of the battery should be better. And uh, if, you, if you focus on the polarization curves for both, for cells constru constructed with exactly the same conditions, where we only changed the, uh, the membrane in the middle, we can see that the, um, the, the SPEAK is actually exhibits higher power density and, and lower area-specific resistance. So overall, low, it exhibits lower crossover and lower resistance, both of which are, are excellent uh, um, properties for, for increasing the performance of these batteries. Now, the next thing we have to, to, to study in this case is the um, long-term stability of the system. And if we were to cycle this for, for longer periods of time, we can see that the uh, the capacity remains relatively constant, with um, Nafion, uh, the Nafion cell exhibiting a capacity loss per cycle of about 0.035%, and the SPEAK-based uh, system exhibits a uh, capacity loss per cycle of about 0.018%. So again, the, the SPEAK looks uh, looks like a reasonable candidate for this. The uh, the issue arises from the differences in current efficiency, and that's that's this plot on the on the right, where you can see that the current efficiency is constant but lower for the SPEAK system compared to the Nafion cell. And um, what we think is happening with those uh, that small number of electrons that seems to be getting lost in the process is that they interact with molecules that are formed due to um, anion, anionic attack of the or nucleophilic attack of the backbone of that, that uh, SPEAK backbone. So in, in, in heavily alkaline conditions, these, these uh, negatively charged oxygens can attack the ring and ultimately leave, uh, lead to chain session. And once you start generating sol soluble intermediates, those can interact with the electrodes and then undergo further oxidative processes. To confirm that this is actually happening, we uh, performed some um, gel permeation chromatography on those polymers before cycling, after cycling, and after exposing it to KOH for, for four weeks. And uh, what we noticed is exposure to KOH and cycling, which is also exposure to COH, uh, KOH and, um, and electrochemical cycling, both resulted in, in the change in the shape of the molecular weight distribution. More specifically, you lose the, uh, the fraction of low molecular weight chains present in that, in that polymer or in that polymer mixture. So what we think it's happening is, as the chain scission occurs, eventually the, um, those, those macromolecules will reach a limiting molecular weight that allows them to dissolve in the electrolyte, 
and then they are lost from the membrane. So you don't see them when you perform the GPC analysis and after cycling or after exposing for four weeks to KOH. So if that is the case, then we should be able to find those fragments in the electrolyte solutions. And if you do HPLC analysis of those electrolyte solutions, the, uh, the chromatogram shows a number of different signals, a number of different peaks, but uh, molecular weight determinations and fragmentation patterns of a, a number of these are consistent with structures that would come from the, um, the ether cleavage of those, uh, those components. So these degradation products are consistent with the, uh, with the backbone cleavage that we, we have predicted is happening. So what we learned from this is that uh, the use of polyaromatic macromolecules that are not fluorinated could potentially lead to better battery performance if you can avoid the, uh, the need to use potentially cleavable linkages under heavily alkaline conditions like, like the ones we use in these, uh, in these types of batteries. So an interesting candidate that will, will meet all these requirements can be made by the friedel crass reaction of a fluorinated ketone and this biphenolic group. And in the presence of a, of a strong Lewis acid, uh, you, can, you can generate this polymer that now does not have any oxygens in the backbone and has only carbon-carbon bonds. Now, sulfonation of this polymer generates a material that could potentially be ionically conductive. The only challenge with this particular structure is that the uh, trifluoromethane groups um, in the backbone can statically hinder full sulfonation of the backbone. So they limit the number of sulfonic acid groups you can integrate into that, that structure because they, they crowd up the space uh, close to that um, to that other position right here. Now, one easy solution to that, uh, to that problem is to modify the, the reaction conditions to add a third monomer that allows uh, uh, chemical modification of the, the, the species in the middle. And then that chemical modification could lead to a whole bunch of different properties. Uh, you, can, you can sulfonate further to make a highly ionic conductive structure but you could also add groups in there that allow you better hydrophobicity control and swelling control so then, then you could potentially go to even higher ion exchange capacities without compromising the uh, mechanical and dimensional stability of your film. We have made a few of these candidates and uh, in general they exhibit reasonable conductivities that are similar on co comparable to Nafion, very cyanide permeabilities that are also lower or comparable to those measured with Nifion, ion exchange capacities that are, are acceptable for these types of application, and um, polarization curves of cells run under the same conditions as Nifion or Speak show um, performance that is comparable and actually lands sort of in the middle between Speak and Nifion, which is really, really encouraging. So then the, the next step here is to increase the number of candidates to synthesize and then further study uh, the, the ability to cycle them long term and, um, and, and to confirm that there is, uh, there is no degradation after, uh, after cell cycling. We know that there is no degradation after exposure to base, but uh, we haven't done long term cycling for these particular molecules. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude by summarizing what I've just told you. The speak membrane showed lower area specific resistance, lower electrolyte crossover, the assemblies of flow batteries in the, using this particular molecule uh, or this particular compound uh, exhibit higher peak power density, lower capacity loss per cycle. The, uh, the only issue with them is that the membranes are not long-term stable at pH 14. The good news is there are alternative molecules that are non perfluorinated and do not exhibit the same degradation at the alkaline conditions. So the, the plan is to, to further expand that effort in that direction. With that, I would just like to acknowledge the, uh, the Aziz and Gordon groups for their, for their help with this work and the inspiration of, of, of that idea, uh, ARPA-E and Clark University for funding. If you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to email me. I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you.